I got a school teacher. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, then, and I got asked if I understood. Um, I had only understood that one sentence, you know, just to clarify. I only understand one out of every ten words in a German, so it makes for some wonderful confusion, usually. Just, uh, just in case. Yeah. I, uh, I'll just do this. This song requires no introduction, and then some of them will, and I'll introduce them. <laughs> But it keeps getting worse each time the landlord lobby pulls the strings of the purse. When the human right to housing isn't even part of the debate, you know you're living in a failed state. When millions of citizens are spending half their lives locked up in a prison for trying to survive, when laws must be broken just to have a place to stay, when the prisons pay the senators to look the other way, if you have to be a criminal to put food upon your plate, you know you're living in a failed state. Underwater when climate change denier runs the nation. And the opposition party votes for oil rigs and pipelines. It's not so much a country as it is a corporation. Buckling under its weight, you know you're living in a failed state. The only thing your leaders can think to do is attack bipartisan consensus that we need to spend 700 billion before the year's end on a military budget to make America great. You know you're living in a failed state. When almost every day some psycho with a gun has to open fire on a crowd before it's done. When a music festival becomes a free fire zone, and all I can say is it's okay now he was acting alone. Buy some armor, pray to God, and hide behind the gate. You know you're living in a failed state. You know you're living in a failed earlier, which I was at, uh, which it was very much smaller than the demonstration for Rojava, which I discovered by accident as I was looking around for an iPad stand. So, that's, but I love a city where you can just be looking around to try to find an electronic store to buy an iPad stand in, and in the course of wandering around the city, I, I, I came across five demonstrations, and only one of them was large, but uh, they were fun. Chavez was elected like every time he ran. When his socialists took power, that's when the changes began. The opposition started attacking every forward move, but reforms went ahead, the people's welfare improved. A land of such riches that had always gone to so few was reaching places ignored since 14. In Venezuela Millions poured into the streets to stop the coup back then They got the man that they elected back into power again The Bolivarian Revolution became famous worldwide Soon other socialist governments swept in at a red tide Between the Cuban doctors and the Venezuelan oil Millions got medical care, millions tilled the soil of Venezuela. Oh, 
Bush began the sanctions, Obama imposed more, a slow-burning, destabilizing economic war. Following the formula of the Chicago Boys team, he used in many places to make economies scream. Oil prices plummeted, foreign holdings locked, invasions being planned, negotiations blocked in Venezuela. Revolution to Venezuela today, from the Seminoles to Salvador Allende. Look at their ankles, you'll see the chains. Imperial vampires, open veins. Those who stand up to the business elite, who cannot stand to see the workers in the driver's seat in Venezuela. In Venezuela. even big things happening and you don't know what the results will be and you may never know but then sometimes you find out 40 years later and there was a uh, a Belgian Chilean filmmaker who was working on a film and he came across some information that uh, the uh, labor action in Scotland in the 1970s had, had much more impact than anybody had known back at the time. This is what happened in three minutes. Rhyming. Jet fighters bombed the palace. We all watched it on TV. The 11th of September, 1973. All across the world, people cried in vain as we heard stories of the students being tortured and slain. Stories of the workers, shop stewards, and the rest being slaughtered at the new dictator's behest. Labor groups condemned it, said they were on the workers' side including all the engineers of East Kilbride. People organized a boycott of General Pinochet, who had overthrown a with boy the hawker hunter jet. Then a few months later, March of 74, Bob Fulton came to work at the Rolls-Royce factory floor. He looked at the orders that had come in that day, and concretes with jet engines from Chile. Jet engines from the Air Force across the ocean wide, sent to be repaired in East Kilbride. It didn't take a minute for Fulton and his mates to come to the decision. They would not touch these crates. Soon 4,000 Rolls Royce workers Voted, they agreed to stand with the Chileans in their hour of need. Management decried them, the Tory screamed and cussed, but the Hawker Hunter engines were left to sit and rust. Nowhere else on earth were workers qualified to repair the engines sitting there in East Kilbride. It's often hard to know. You've changed anything a whit, but decades later a Chilean general would admit. For a time in Santiago, there were no fighters in the sky, because the whole Chilean Air Force had not one jet that could fly. They may not have changed the world, this group of union engineers, but these crates of metal sat corroding for four years. So here's the British labor, how for four years it tried to do what could be done from East Kilbride. 
Jet fighters bombed the palace. We all watched it on TV. The 11th of September, 1973. So um, after the global financial crisis of 2008, um, the, all the uh, crooked bankers who invented all these schemes that they fooled everybody with and made all this incredible, I mean, these people made all these horrible investments, so, you know, what happened. And no bankers went to prison in the United States so far, zero. But in the small island nation of Iceland, 40, 40, 40, 40 bankers have gone to prison. So this song is in celebration of the Icelandic banker jailers. It's a sing-along. Sing it has a bad word in it, but you'll all be okay. Iceland is an island with half a million or so Vikings, mostly known for volcanoes, hot springs and fishing, known for its welfare state, for being good and socialistic. Certainly not known for being corrupt or nepotistic, but in the USA and Europe, when they were deregulating banks, Iceland's politicians took bribes to join their ranks. Soon you had a situation one would think just couldn't be, a bank whose debt was worth ten times the country's GDP. When Wall Street imploded, sure enough it spread. Banks all over the world were floating in the red. All over the world, governments made the plan to cut spending and raise taxes on the working woman and working man. The banks were bailed out while the people had to pay. But in Iceland, people thought there must be a better way. And the earth stood still a moment. Fear was struck in every top. When Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers to fuck off. Lovely. Folks were in the streets of Reykjavik and just couldn't be ignored. They said this is a debt we Icelanders can't afford. Let's guarantee deposits of all our people, yes indeed. But as for all the speculators motivated by their greed to make really dumb investments, then that Iceland said good luck. Sorry for your losses, but we don't really give a fuck. The one percent trembled when they took away the trough. When Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers to fuck off. The UK called them terrorists and we cannot let this stand. Who do these peasnik blocks think they are in Iceland? They threatened isolation and economy and Claims, but the Icelanders said, sorry, but the banks can settle their own claims, though that might be harder for them now that they're under house arrest, or else they fled the country as they were once unwelcome guests, and now Reykjavik's recovery just makes the fat cat scoff, since Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers to fuck off. If you haven't heard of this example, perhaps there's a reason why. The owners of the world don't want this kind of shit to fly. They say we all must pay up. It is shaped down by the mob if we can't afford to pay the rent because we don't have a job. They say it's not their problem if we're forever shackled by their debt. We must save the 1% from the fate they should have met. But there is an alternative, though it makes the fat cats cough. Since Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers to fuck. Since Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers, Iceland told the bankers to fuck off. During the uh, all the big protests in Iceland, which involved some amazing percentage of the overall population of the island, when you consider, you know, and um, there there was one guy 
who uh, raised, uh, took down the Icelandic flag above the parliament and uh, raised the flag of the biggest supermarket chain in Iceland. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And that man was last seen in Syria. Listen to your friends from New York to California. Consider for a moment Sulaimania. The last city volunteers would often see before. They hiked over the mountain and joined the war. For the freedom of the people of Russia. Guns wielded by Rojava, stars and suns, along with scores of those who come from far and near, who learn to fire mortars so they can fight right here for the freedom of the people of Rojava. What makes a person go from Occupy Wall Street to marching through the desert with blisters on their feet? To risk life and liberty, to face Islamic State, they'll make that martyrdom will likely be their fate. For the freedom of the people of Rojava. Something worth defending isn't hard to find, but not many will go off and leave their homes behind to go train on the mountain with the YPG to go join somebody struggle out of solidarity. For the freedom of the people of Rojava. The blood of many folk has been spilled along the way, including several martyrs for the USA. So remember Robert Grant and Michael Israel, how all Tom and Jordan McIntyre, how they lived and how they fell. For the freedom of the people of Rojava. For the freedom of the people of Rojava. For the freedom of the people of Rojava. I did one about my landlord. Yeah. This is always a unifying factor. This is. Uh, I mean, I've, I've discovered that that um, whatever else people agree or disagree about, nobody likes the landlord. <laughs> and and that, that keeps on getting more extreme as Berlin and Copenhagen and many of the other places I play in become increasingly gentrified, which I always feel kind of good and bad about that. It's kind of like one of those things that hey, I've written 23 songs about strangling landlords, so it's nice that they're becoming more popular, but it's a shame, too, that people can relate to my hostility towards my landlord. This has been a therapeutic process for me writing songs about strangling my landlord in order not to strangle my landlord. That's the basic, the basic process, the basic, you know. It's called Letter to My Landlord. Writing in this letter because among the choices it's probably better than listening to voices raging in my head saying point and shoot then after you're dead your face meets my boot I don't know your name, it's better that way cause I can't play this game, who knows what I'll say I feel like I'm burning, I've had it up a year it's time that you were learning the meaning of fear I live in these apartments at your private property among your residents most of us agree that you're a piece of shit how does that make you feel? we don't like you one bit and that's for real we think you're a thief that you don't care, seems you want belief. Whatever the market will bear, whatever you can get away with, what you can make us pay. If we ever get justice, you should hear that day, landlord. But it's not just you, it's all your kin. The things you do cause the state we're in. You bribe the politicians so they let you off the Now the legal situation's just the one you need. For you to make millions, for profits to be high, but even billions won't be with you when you die. Hope you find a death you seek, beat the devil that you serve. If you live another week, that's more life than you deserve. Plan more. In the class 
hard to wait till there's no question who is winning But if there's any justice, this is only the beginning The next act in the play will be written by the tenants And until your dying day, you'll be paying penance Your assets will be seized, that's a given You profiteers of misery, start spending time in prison Then you can get a job, figure out what you do best You can keep the house you live in, but we're taking all our best landlords several uh, general strikes in, in, in different cities in North America, all of which ended in massacres, which is notable that, you know, the rules of the game are supposed to be with labor, you know, is supposed to be there's strikes and there's contracts and there's negotiations, and, but when it comes down to it, there's massacres. In the case of the Winnipeg general strike in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Canada, um, it, you know, it kind of backfired in a big way. War key, men were drafted, many never made it back. Those who did discovered in their absence they got the sack. Tenements in squalor, both rats and people getting sick. What they had in common, life was short, death was quick. No one had a plan what they were going to do When all the men came back home and the ranks of the unemployed grew The way the people had to live was no life at all But it still came as a surprise How many answered the call if you weren't there you'll never know Just what it was like when the whole city went on City leaders and newspapers, in many ways they tried to do everything they could to widen the divide between good Canadians and those they call alien scum, between those who missed conscription and those who beat the war drum. <coughs> when the veterans marched in Winnipeg, they marched for everyone. Under the banner of the working class, the one big union. Everybody left their jobs, whether organized or not. Even the policemen walked away, refused to embrace the rat. If you weren't there, you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike. Mayor deputized the scabs, soon they shot two men who died in the city center on the hour when the scabs rampaged through the city, attacking anyone in the street, trapping people in alleyways, not even allowing them to retreat. Soldiers occupied the city. People hadn't eaten in weeks. The prospects for victory began to look bleak. People went back to their jobs, if indeed they even could. The bosses said they'd seek revenge, and many of them were. If you weren't there, you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike. Strike leaders were imprisoned from where several were elected to the Canadian Parliament. And a monument was erected at Main and Portage, where a streetcar was overturned, driven in by strike breakers on the spot where it was burned. It was a century ago, but life is often still defined by which side you were on, on that picket line. Was your grandpa shot in the heart, or did they break his leg? When the working class rose up and shut down Winnipeg, if you weren't there, you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on. 
This month, uh, October, October 2014, what the world learned, or some small percentage of people in the world learned, that the dog who had once been the most famous dog in all of Europe had passed away of complications from tear gas inhalation. And um, in the next few weeks, the video on YouTube to this song got 100,000 views in Greece. But uh, I still don't have fans in Greece because there's a language barrier. But they like this song. And I'm happy, very happy about that. Awesome folks are revolting. They've had enough of this shit. The rich are getting richer. They're saying that's it. But with Luke, it's different, that's clear, as he verges from the fog. Let's hear it for Luke and it calls the riot dog. It's a fight between people, but he is no pawn. He knows exactly which side he's on. In the machine of no con. Let's hear it for Luke and it calls the riot dog. When a smoke bomb comes towards him, he kicks it back at the buzz. He acts a bit different than a normal dog does. He's got a fan page on Facebook, but he's got no time for a blog. Let's hear it for Luke and the riot dog. Let's hear it for Luke and it goes the riot dog. So I know it's impossible to keep up with uh, developments in the United States, but um, one of the things that is going on is a trial uh, where a man named Scott Warren in Arizona is, uh, is, is facing a possible 20-year prison sentence if a jury finds him guilty. The last jury found a, was a hung jury. It's not as good as it sounds. It's, it just means they, could, they couldn't decide. Um, but, um, not nearly as good as a hung parliament, which is also an expression they use in Britain. It has nothing to do with gallows. But, um, the, um, what Scott Warren is facing 20 years in prison uh, for transporting feeding and clothing people without papers. The implications for the rest of society are pretty clear if he's found guilty. If you go to Pima County in the Sonoran Desert Lands You'll find the town of Ajo among the cactus stands the only town you'll see, the only water too. When someone is thirsty, there's no question what you do. For well over a century, it was a normal thing to have an extra jug of water that you might bring. In the harsh Sonoran Arizona summer heat We'd rather give the vultures 
something else to eat. You didn't ask where I was going, nor where I've been. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you gave me clothes. I was a stranger. You let me in. I have this book here, a story I learned well. I always thought I understood the tale that it tells. It's spelled out very clearly in Matthew 25. What a good Christian does when a stranger arrives. You didn't ask where I was going, nor where I've been. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you gave me clothes. I was a stranger. Now there's a crackdown with life and death on trial. The only place with water for a hundred miles. Facing twenty years in prison is a very mighty rod. Now all of us are forced to choose between Caesar and God. You didn't ask where I was going, nor where I'd been. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you gave me clothes. I was a stranger. You let me in. You let me in. the transition, yeah, because we're still in Arizona, see, it's like, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I, I was, uh, I kind of figured it out by accident, other people have written books about this, but I, I'm an amateur historian, so I start by collecting stories and then realize they're connected, and then one day I realized every major foreign policy decision made by the United States government from the revolution up until the Civil War, or just before the Civil War, was made primarily to defend the institution of slavery. This is true of the invasion of Florida in 1811, which was free in Seminole territory, and the invasion of Canada in 1812, which did not go well at all for the invading forces, and the invasion of Mexico. And there were thousands of U.S. troops who deserted from the army as they got deeper into Mexico, realizing they were participating in an imperial land grab in a primarily Protestant army. And, uh, but there were 202 of them who not only deserted from the U.S. army, but they joined the Mexican army. Most of them were Irish, some were Polish. They came from different places. My name is John Ryan. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there, in the wet poles and hillsides, that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army, with the morals of a bayonet blade. And there amidst all these poor dying Catholics, screaming 
still with the burning stench of it all. Myself and two hundred Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We marched beneath the green flag of St. Patrick, emblazoned with Erin Gobra. Right with the heart and the shamrock, and the red tad powder they both the gun. Just fifty years after Wolf Tone, five thousand miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may. But from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. Except for on the chairs, the chair, the, the cushions. Oh, yeah, here we go. And uh, but uh, the first time the red flag was ever flown as a symbol of revolution, according to Wikipedia. <laughs> I have to say because I don't know. Really, they might be wrong. According to Wikipedia and according to many historians, but I don't know about all of them. But uh, you know, they, people often, historians too, often tend to like to say in the world when what they really mean is like in the country that they're studying. And then they think, oh, it must be the whole world because as far as I can tell, you know, but you know, then they turn out to be wrong. Anyway, it's, I think the first time the red flag was used as a symbol of revolution on planet Earth was in the town of Merthyr Tydfil in Wales in 1831, in late May. And it wasn't just a red flag. It was a red flag with a loaf of bread impaled by the flagpole with blood dripping from the bread. That was the symbol of this rebellion in Wales. It was just a few years before the labor movement really got started. Uh, the labor movement, like the, the trade union councils of England and Scotland and Wales, got started a few years later in a big way. And then people had these ideas about striking and contracts. And, but before that, 
they cut your wages, you know, there were certain other ways you could make things clear. Like with guns, knives, and yeah. So they didn't overthrow the government. Just in case you're, you know, I don't want to spoil the ending, but. <laughs> 1831, the age of industry begun. For the working folk of Wales, life was short. With wages cut again, it was only sensible that then folks took over, shut down the debtors' court. The gentry pulled the wire, told their men to open fire and restore the rule of their estate. But as the night descended and the battle ended, the soldiers had all fled behind the gate. They chanted cheese and bread, and our children must be fed in the days when whales rose against the crown. They chanted cheese and bread with a bloody look above their heads when the red flag flew in Merthyr Town. The message went out east and west To put the gentry to the test The cavalry was ambushed and turned back After so long playing defense The time had come now When the workers were the ones on the attack They chanted cheese and bread And our children must be fed In the days when whales rose against the town They chanted cheese and bread With a bloody loaf of their heads when the red flag flew in Berkshire The crowd sent soldiers by the score Till order was restored Then came Dick Pendaren's execution Another martyr for the cause Meant to give us pause The next time people call for a revolution They chanted cheese and bread And our children must be fed In the days when whales rose against the town They chanted cheese and bread With a bloody lump of their heads When the red flag flew in Burford Town is all those wonderful stones embedded in the sidewalks all over the place. And, uh, we need to have them in a lot of other countries. And uh, I've learned a lot from them, from those little stones. Um, but one night a, a communist youth organization in Hamburg was uh, leading a walking tour of the city on May 8th or 9th. And we came across the stones of the grandparents This is a song about my friend Katarina's grandmother. Who is also named Katarina. Katarina Yakov, long before she took that knee. Let's try that again. I got the last song in my head. <laughs> Katarina Yakov, long before she took that knee. Was organizing workers in Hamburg just the same. Organizing beneath the flag of deepest red, a new dawn of peace and freedom clearly shining in her head. Katarina Jakob first was sent to jail when the trappings of democracy all began to fail. She was frequently arrested in and out of custody while her first husband was in hiding from the Nazis. 
Katarina Yakov was acquitted of a crime. But the Gestapo had the last word. They weren't finished with her this time. She was sent to Raven's book of killing hunger at her side. She heard of the execution, how her second husband died. For Katarina Yakov, the end was close at hand. She was on a death march with a ragged, starving band. Marching through a forest, being led by the SS. What would happen hours later seemed impossible to guess. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May. And they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katarina Jakob thought about her children and the friends and comrades taking care of them. Not knowing yet if any of them survived, not knowing that soon she'd see her daughters both alive. Katarina Jakob watched the German soldiers flee, streaming from the east, that's what she was seeing. Allied bombers flew above them, she thought they all might die, and then soon there was the silence of all the SS men. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katarina Yakov saw red flags flapping in the breeze above the Russian tanks, and she fell upon her knees. And so many different voices in so many different tongues sang the most beautiful song that could ever have been sung. In German, Lithuanian, in Polish, and in Dutch, a myriad of melodies as never had been such. In Russian and in Yiddish, Italian and French emerged from the forest beneath the trench. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang. It's a good thing, but sometimes it's a bad thing. Um, mixed, mixed plus. I have a toddler, so I know all about feeling things strongly. Toddlers feel everything much more strongly because it's like new. Like, what's, what do you feel? The first time you get bitten by a cat, you've never been bitten by a cat. You've never been bitten by anything. You know, that's, that's a big deal. You know, it doesn't seem like a big deal now, but when you're three, it's a big deal. You know? An anarchist and a communist were in a car together. 
Who was driving? The cop. That's my favorite joke. I like ecumenical humor and divisive music. I don't drive a car because they run on gas, but if I did, it would run on biomass. I ride a bike or sometimes a skateboard. So fuck off all you drivers and your yummy hordes. Sitting all day in the traffic queues, I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't eat meat. Dumpster dives with you people in that restaurant. I think you are so sad when you could have been eating bagels like the ones that I just had. I think it is a shame all the birds want things you do. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't wear leather and I like my clothes in black. And I made a really cool hammock from a moldy coffee sack. I like to hop on freight trains. I think that is so cool. It's so much funner doing this than being stuck in school. I can't believe you're wearing those brand new shiny shoes. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't believe in readers. I think consensus is the key. I don't believe in stupid notions like representative democracy. Whether or not it works, I know it is the case that only direct action can save the human race. So when I see you in your voting booth, then I know it's true. I'm a better anarchist than you. I am not a pacifist. I like throwing bricks at when the cops have caught me and I've taken a few licks. I always feel lucky if I get a bloody nose because I feel so militant and everybody knows. By the time the riot is all through, I'm a better anarchist than you. I'm a better anarchist than you. favorite people are these, um, they're often elderly religious Catholics who habitually, as soon as they get out of prison, they go and pour blood on a missile silo and go back to prison. And then you get to meet them in between prison sentences. And so sometimes it's like well, this legendary person that of course nobody outside of prison has met very much, you know. And then they get out of prison, it's like, oh, let's have this guy over for dinner and we're going to you know, we'll make plans, we'll do things, we've got a place for you to stay, you know, and then a few weeks later, uh, he went and poured blood on another missile silo, and he's going back into prison, where the diet makes his diabetes work worse, but, you know, he has other things to worry about. But if, if, like, only 10,000 people, well-placed in different countries, with sledgehammers, swung them at the same time, then it could be more than just symbolic action, you know, because there's only so many fighter jets in the world or helicopter gunships, and they are all very susceptible to sledgehammers, in fact, like when they're on the ground. Like the, the nose cone of a fighter jet is apparently worth millions of dollars and is can be completely destroyed with one good swing of a sledgehammer. Air Airplanes are actually quite fragile things. Watched it on the team. Machine guns. Fire towards the ground. Watch the people run. Helicopter gunship. Strafing the street. Watch the lining of the bodies. In the Baghdad heat. They say these leaks had consequences, and I must agree. When I saw them fire on the children, it affected me. I thought, what if I were wearing the other shoe? If I had a hammer, what would I do? I am just a person. Just another mother's son. I have no special powers. I cannot fly. 
over here if anybody is interested and if you can remember my name then you can find me online I'm on Spotify and YouTube and all those places and I have a podcast two podcasts and a monthly live stream broadcast so if you look for me online you'll find those things and um Hitman out and if you look Hitman oh Hitman foul oh Hitman e Hitman c Hitman s Was heißt der Name? Robix. Robix. So we have to have a spell it now. That's a good technique. I gotta remember that. Yeah. I stole it from you. <laughs> Sorry, but not exactly. And if you want to learn how to support artists like me and others in the post-merch era with our income at roughly half what it used to be, which is, of course, true of many other professions, journalists, you know, it's not just us. But uh, we often do a subscription model of survival, and if you want to read about that, you can go to my website, davidrovics.com. There's your commercial announcement for the evening. You may not realize that as U.S. citizens, we're required to make commercial announcements uh, when we leave the country on the 24-hour basis, so we lose our passports. <laughs> Oh, and I'm playing in Freiburg on Monday night, and the Hambach Forest on Wednesday, and then I go to Ireland. And if you know anybody in Freiburg or, or in the middle of the woods, somewhere near Cologne. The death toll keeps mounting. It's time to turn on my phone. Another mass shooting. Another free fire zone. The failed states of America. White supremacist rule. A society risen with victims and tools. The fires keep burning. Completely out of control. Makes you miss the old days of the ozone hole. 
the snow is all melting the lakes of Greenland the best hope that I have I hold in my hand if there's a tomorrow that when yesterday's through you have me Yesterday's through 